right uh, welcome back we're in uh week 10 which makes this is the third last week to a uh, rather shortened semester kind of blink and you miss it it's it's uh, quite a strange feeling okay uh let me see okay <laughs> So just got a message saying um, from one student saying, uh, good, we're using Zoom because Moodle is crashing. Uh, yeah, uh, kind of peak load, right? Three weeks before the end of semester. Um, heaps of submissions, whole bunch of things. Um, yeah, yikes. Um, that's also, by the way, one reason why, particularly with the introduction to business class, I'm very deliberately all the video on demand, put them onto a YouTube channel because just the uh, the prospect of being having everything being beholden to one network is pretty awful. Quite happy to um, outsource all my backup and delivery at the um, expense of Google. They make enough money off us with our attention anyway. Okay, uh, lots to cover today. Uh, first of all, a couple of couple of announcements. Um, Thanks very much to everyone who submitted the uh, project, the A or the A1 task. Um, I noticed about five or six people had uploaded in a timely kind of fashion, but there was a final menu they hadn't clicked through to just simply confirm submission. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, have the material if it's there, it was there. Um, and the defaults I've got for admission for submissions is everything that's there at the time of the dead off, the deadline is is stored. Um, so no one's um, failed to submit something. Several people have realized belatedly that their status of whatever it was was unsubmitted and have panicked, wrote to me saying, oh, am I going to get penalized and whatever? Um, but no need to worry. So we've got that there. And uh, obviously, this is a very steep learning curve with um, Moodle. I'm s still struggling with some um, strange counterintuitive aspects of interfaces and stuff. So uh, no problems there. Um, of course, the next Moodle related thing is uh, the quiz. We, we have the third quiz. And according to the, the original schedule I gave you, I was going to open it um, as soon as this live session was finished and then to close it off at midnight on Friday. But um, given that uh, there's a whole bunch of video material on what online and whatnot, that um, I can see the click through rates have been incredibly slow off the website um, and that you've had so much else to do. I don't uh, think anyone will complain if I delay that a little bit. So um, I've got the uh, the quiz made, but I'll uh, turn it on from Thursday and then we'll turn it off uh, just before midnight on Sunday night. So that will give you the weekend as well. And I know um, some of you are taking other classes, including one of mine, actually the introduction to business uh, that actually has something else due on Friday afternoon. So better just to, to uh, spread the load a bit. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's a simple reminder, of course, that uh, a bunch of the multiple choice questions are actually encouraging, rewarding people to look at those example videos um, in the topics ranging 15, 16, 17, 18, okay, up to um, gaining attention. Uh, so those examples that are listed uh, under those two separate pages, because 18 is its own standalone uh, page on the website. Also to have a look at the uh, the top of the blog feed, which I will show in a moment anyway. There's one interesting thing I, I want you to see at the very top, but um, we'll, um, as a break halfway through the session, um, I'll just show one thing that I've posted up anyway, just to remind us about um, how very dramatic uh, design uh, visual design can engage an audience um, and at the same time uh, do some interesting things emotionally. So that's a Shiseido example we'll look at. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to go back to unfinished business. That is our discussion about designing communicative spaces. So I'll go straight over to the share screen and we'll um, pick up from there. Okay, I'm, um, I have been 
conscious actually, particularly in the Zoom seems to have changed its kind of defaults in terms of video output and whatnot. That particularly one of, one of the downsides of actually running through the PDF is I have to be a little bit careful about where I situate it with the screen share because the aspect ratio of 16 to nine um, for video is not the same as the four by three aspect ratio, which is the default on Zoom and particularly uh, PowerPoints and whatnot that have been made for four, uh, three ratio rather than 16, nine. So um, on one of the videos that I've uploaded, I've had to actually very significantly adjust, adjust the field and you get some crop at top and bottom and uh, that leaves a little bit out. So I'll try and land the, uh, the key thing smack bang in the middle of the slide. So bear with me if um, anyone has any troubles reviewing the, uh, the material. Okay, so let's uh, move through where we were scrolling down okay um and retail spaces now of course retail spaces they seem to us um coming out of uh lockdown but seeing other places going back into lockdown as has happened in my country in australia in melbourne um not other states in fact other states have closed their borders to victoria uh because they they've had a second wave of COVID 19 and so people are back to this stay at home, work at home unless absolutely necessary and only go shopping for essentials. So some of the things we, we absolutely took for granted in the past, the ability to just free roam in retail spaces and sometimes have huge numbers of people in temporary spaces, such as a motor show, Tokyo Motor Show, which is packed, uh, or Comic-Con or so many of these other really big events uh, that we have, say, in Tokyo, very dedicated big dedicated spaces for them. The wonderfully named Tokyo Big Site, for example. Uh, all those kind of mega events uh, suddenly look like a luxury where they just seemed entirely normal and a key aspect of corporate communications uh, design for all companies. Uh, the largest range of these major temporary display spaces are actually trade shows. So it's not actually geared towards customers, it's actually uh, geared towards industry participants, buyers, for example. And so this is a very significant thing, whatever industry you end up in, going to the various trade shows. Indeed, universities literally have a trade show. It started out as, the, uh, as NAFSA, the North American Foreign Student Advisors Conference, where people who used to advise international students coming to American universities after World War II used to meet annually and talk about issues. Uh, it actually morphed over time into the largest higher education trade show in the world where universities set up their booth or their stand or sometimes governments coordinate national representations of higher education systems. Uh, Waseda, for example, owns a company uh, subsidiary which on behalf of JAFSA, the Japanese version of NAFSA, organizes um, a common Japan space uh, at the, uh, the annual conference. And there are certain efficiency reasons why you have these really big kind of trade shows that you get around and you can get to see all of the developments happening in a particular um, product space in a year. Uh, it's a very efficient way to network. Uh, Waseda, for example, in, in the context of NAFSA and its European equivalent, um, they send quite a few people to literally stand around on booths and um, meet with partners coming from other institutions. And there are a bunch of specialist companies who provide uh, the facilities, the, the, the quite portable facilities, the equipment that allows um, firms or organizations like a university uh, to set up a, uh, a more or less persuasive designed communicative space in these temporary uh, trade shows. So to go back a step, um, when we're talking about more permanent spaces, uh, the single brand versus the multi-brand distinction, that's just where we finished up last time. Uh, the fundamental problem with the department stores is the uh, how do you actually communicate lots of different brand identities through a common retail space? And I mentioned Selfridges in London as a good example of how this can be well done. Um, we do see many department stores in Tokyo who've struggled with this and they've ended up kind of dividing their um, often quite in impressive open retail spaces into various subspaces. Okay. 
Um, typical kind of trade pop-up space is something like you see here, temporary walls, um, uh, printed and uh, attached, okay? Temporary lighting that can be fitted, product being displayed, uh, huge array of industries have these. Motor shows are very striking in how much the major car companies will actually spend on this. Uh, I think at the last motor show last year, the, uh, the most impressive one for me was actually Honda. Um, and uh, Honda worked with Hakuhodo to, with a subsidiary of Hakuhodo, part of Hakuhodo, that do uh, communicative spaces, these temporary communicative spaces. And the guy who headed the uh, project, his background was in animation, um, actually, uh, was a, a top student at Digital Hollywood University, uh, uh, did a very interesting kind of graduation project there, hired by Hakuhodo because they understand that um, more and more of the corporate communications will blend the physical, the analog and the digital. So if anyone went to the motor show and saw what Honda had done, that they used very clever um, mix of product that uh, often storied product that you could touch you could actually get on some of the iconic old motorbikes scooters and various things that they'd made over the years um, and there was also a get on a motorbike but also have a virtual experience as well and be able to even download the video of you actually virtually riding this this um, motorbike um, with 3d 3d projection mapping for example through an imagined landscape um, and then massive uh, digital displays where effectively you had digital contents that uh, told the brand story and the brand aspiration. So the flagship store, we understand very well, and this is where I finished up last time, the um, uh, way that the store communicates an ethos to consumers to engage with, with uh, people, particularly uh, if they're out and about just exploring the city that, uh, you know, that wonderful French notion, the flaneur, someone who just wanders around uh, living the good life, savoring the good life and um, will browse the, uh, the facades, the, uh, the windows, the window shopping, and wander into stores and have various brand experiences, not necessarily without spending us with, with any money whatsoever, um, have various brand experiences at these key touch points. So the combination of the virtual and the digital and these signature spaces, spaces with the flagship store are uh, critical to contemporary brand communications. Lux brands understand this, and we see that a whole lot of brands, uh, companies with brands that they want to try and shift up mark to uh, uh, up market to attract premium, they are looking to create an emotive flagship store experience. Um, more and more, the facades themselves speak to this, and uh, the architecture itself need not be impressive, but the, structurally, but the facade can be impressive, and of course, the immediate interior space can be. Um, and it's interesting to see the transformation of urban landscapes. This is in Dalian in China, and actually, uh, I took this five or six years ago, actually. Um, which gives a real sense of the enormous significance of particularly second tier Chinese cities as very large markets for premium French um, and other European brands. Uh, facades, um, I haven't actually been to uh, the reworked uh, loft store in Shibuya, actually. I, I'm getting a bit too old for Shibuya. Um, so I haven't been there recently, but they, they had this, I don't know if they've, if they've still got it, if it's still there, someone message me on, on chat and tell me. Uh, they had this wonderful thing they did with the, uh, the logo, with um, it moving in pieces and stopping and, and uh, reassembling. Um, I want to speak briefly to the select store phenomena, because the select store itself is really a, an act of curation. It, what it's, it, it's What it's saying is that we have a particular sensibility, a finger on the pulse of both trends and the timeless, um, particular skill in taking our refined tastes out to the world at large and engaging in this buyer function and, and curating an array of product uh, for people uh, of a certain segment uh, who identify with our sensibility broadly. This is S Nation in Roppongi Hills, but what is quite striking in Japan is a very large proportion of fashion retailing in Japan has come to be dominated by the major select stores. 
and they have different origins. You get companies like say Tomorrowland um, and ships which started out as um, knitwear manufacturers, as, fab as literally fabric manufacturers, for example, and then evolved into uh, the full clothing business, hiring designers, creating their own stores, and then developing a very significant select component as well. So you see a lot of these stores, they'll have their own in-house brands, plus they will have uh, third-party brands that they have sourced from all over the place. And Beams, for example, which actually doesn't have its origins in making fabric or clothes, but indeed as a um, an importer of particularly American wear, it was surfwear and uh, American casual, and has become one of the predominant, uh, in fact, in terms of market share, the largest select store chain. Uh, they have a lot of their own in-house brands because often the margins are a lot higher, just we see uh, with supermarkets uh, have their own house brands as well. But also their house brands are easier to sell at a premium if they also have a curated selection of other impressive product. It's partly about creating store ambience. It's partly about communicating the, uh, the sensibility of the buyers uh, involved. So another significant aspect of this, of course, is uh, coordinating with personalities, uh, using prominent um, individuals who may be immediately recognized to communicate a certain ethos. Now, this is, uh, uh, this this guy's a professional surfer in Australia, but he's also a model. And now that's a beard. It's not one of those little, you know, rat peering through a toilet brush, crappy looking little little bits of messy facial hair. That is a serious beard. Um, I have a few friends with beards like that, and that's why I don't do the hipster beard thing because there's absolutely no way I compete. Um, specialization according to one's comparative advantage, and my comparative advantage is not facial hair. Um, so. This guy, of course, is pretty famous for his surfing, uh, but a, a select menswear store uh, that also, they, they have a significant tailoring function as well associated with him to reach out to, ex to effectively extend the market for premium uh, formal wear uh, and you know, business, business attire in the Australian market, partly because they recognized, of course, that uh, many of the high earners these days actually were coming through new firms, whether they were in, um, uh, say, IT startups or whatever, a huge array of businesses, and that they weren't just selling to the suits of old in law firms and in finance, not least actually because both law and finance in Australia are increasingly feminized disciplines. So many more of the top students coming out of law and finance programs um, in Australia are women. And we see in the top law firms now, many more women represented in terms of new hires. And so the old markets for high-end menswear were diminishing, partly with the casualization in general of workforce. And of course, COVID-19 and um, lockdown is raising interesting questions about whether we will see more casualization or less. I think people go both ways. I must say I've, I've been astounded at how many people I see wearing bad track suits and uh, Crocs on public transport. Um, it does remind me of that first successful um, uh, manners campaign that uh, Metro did with that do it at home with this whole series of people putting makeup on and, and uh, whatnot. Um, so yeah, some, some people uh, seem to have spent weeks and weeks and weeks in their worst attire at home and it just kind of stumbled out the door to go to work or or whatever on the other hand i've i've seen some people in meetings and whatnot who despite the fact that they're from home absolutely insist on wearing a crisp iron shirt every single day um i'm i'm trying to wear a collar every day at very least okay um this is, I think, pretty instantly recognizable as Muji. This is actually uh, an interesting kind of question because Muji in the United States has actually just gone into Chapter 11 um, bankruptcy uh, to protect itself from the, the impact of COVID-19. It's a subsidiary. Of course, Muji as a whole is okay. Uh, but Muji has been losing money in the United States in recent years, actually, before COVID-19 even came along. Um, but uh, Muji has perhaps the clearest instance of a defining sensibility across a huge array of product. 
And it is said that there's no single Muji store which actually has every Muji product in it. That's quite possible. So there is this kind of Mujification of life that extends all the way to houses, for example. Um, but even Muji has actually gone into the, uh, the select business in a way. Uh, the very first Muji store ever, which is um, at Minami Aoyama, um, on Aoyama Dori there, um, not far from the uh, United Nations University and Aogaku. Uh, the very first little Muji store is now a Muji found. And you'll see in some of their other stores, they'll have a Muji found section as well there too, um, where so they do go out into the world and find interesting things that accord with their particular sensibility associated with Muji um, and present them as found. They don't pass them off as their own um, initiated or designed products. Now, of course, Muji doesn't make anything themselves anyway. They, uh, they're a concept store, effectively. They, they do design, uh, they do large-scale procurement. So they're always outsourcing to large numbers of companies who are not allowed, because of tight contractual arrangements, to say that they're the people making the Muji product. Although when there's compliance issues at stake, such as electrical appliances, um, you can often see the details of who actually makes the product in the fine print um, associated with the product. So when we look at something like this, I don't think people are surprised to hear that this is, of course, Muji. I mean, how, uh, and Fuxao Naoto, for example, Hara Kenya, the design is associated with Muji, Hara Kenya with the, uh, the visual identity, Fuxao Naoto with a range of products actually did this. Um, we kind of recognize that there are Muji attributes there. Some of the, some of the things, of course, it, it has a matte plastic, it's not shiny, uh, as an interesting kind of incremental innovation. The uh, shamoji, the uh, the rice spatula. It has a place to, to actually put the thing. This is um, always one of the uh, the issues that always amazed me. You had all these clever designers making myriad um, rice cookers in Japan. Everyone uses the rice spatula, and no one ever knows where to where to put it. So actually, there are a whole bunch of rice spatulas you can buy that are quite clever. They have a um, a wide base on the end of the handle, so you can actually stand them up to overcome that problem. So there is incremental innovation, uh, which is a critical role for designers, but we can also see that the form of, the, of a thing can communicate a certain sensibility, uh, sense of values. And this notion that um, resign, uh, re re refining something down to its essential essence. Um, now, Hara Kenya gets all philosophical about this, uh, probably in a excuse me, saying so, pretentious kind of way to some degree. Uh, I think uh, Fuxao Nalto is a bit more nuanced um, in terms of this espousing this notion of just enough, but it's not enough, uh, just enough effort. It's actually so often with design, um, it's additive and then it's uh, deductive that you're actually then taking things away and trying to reduce them to their, their um, essence. There is a, a short video. It's very promotional, very cheer, cheer squad for Apple, um, featuring Jonathan Ives. Um, and the now quite a number of years ago, the redesign of the iOS interface that was with iOS seven and the aesthetics there. And they emphasize the, uh, the modesty uh, that the interface should actually retreat into the background um, and that it should foreground your usages or your customization. I think with Muji, if we had to reduce uh, Muji's product design ethos um, down to a single word, uh, it's probably to my mind, something like a canvas. Um, not just because it obviously they, they, they use those kind of um, natural fabric look in so many things, but literally it's a canvas on which you can paint your life story. Oh, cringe. I'm making myself sick saying that. Uh, but in a sense, it retreats to some degree into the background. There is an element of timeliness, timelessness there. Um, it doesn't compete for attention with other things that you would put in your space. Um, arguably too little, perhaps. Uh, I think we can see that IKEA uh, and so much Scandinavian design does show that you can actually make um, a design statement while um, not necessarily uh, overwhelming the uh, what the presence of all the other items that, that one might choose to put in your room. Um, if we want to get a sense of the design ethos um, and to try and separate the influence of the designer 
from the client, it's often difficult, but uh, we can see some hints in the portfolio of work that designers do for other clients. So I think it's particularly interesting if we look at Fukuzawa and Alto. Um, these are chairs in his portfolio that look very Muji, but they're not Muji, okay? Um, and so there is a bit of a chicken and egg thing, you know? Um, what is the, the ethos of Muji? Well, it's indelibly associated with um, key designers who were working for it, um, albeit freelance. Um, and at the same time, the very exposure that Muji gives as a mass market um, product disseminates that ethos. And so the designer gets a lot of leverage and reputational boost through that as well. So we see in the Muji case, of course, it extends all the way to um, houses and whatnot. Um, this to me looks remarkably like uh, a white version of a little house um, in a, a monopoly set. It's kind of cute, you know, reducing it to the essential ethos of a house, the, you know, the, the shape of a house that uh, is culturally constructed that um, so many Western kids from about age three or four all over the world would draw. Um, I, I do find one of the uh, delicious, sometimes kind of when I'm in a grumpy mood, annoying ironies of this is that um, Muji celebrates design and just enough and to some degree plays on its Japanness. Uh, yet most of the Muji houses just have not brought over any of the key um, design features of the traditional house that was so suited to weather like we've had in the last month. Humid and rainy, um, the eaves that the uh, extend, um, the roof that extends over the walls covers a, like an end goer, an open space, for example, which allows you to have the windows um, and even the full shutters open on a rainy day to let the breeze through in a hot and humid place um, like Tokyo in the rainy season makes a heap of sense. I take one look at that and think, you can't open the windows. You're going to have to have air conditioning on all the time. So form and the pursuit of simple evocative form can really triumph uh, over function. Now, Muji would say, oh, yes, but we do have some places with verandas, but also they have the, it's a two-story house and the eaves are not deep enough. And as you know, in this weather, um, rain never falls straight down. It's always at a slant, particularly the strong breeze we get here. Here's the, uh, they, this latest version, they made it deeper. Um, but uh, to, to try and attenuate that, the others were very shallow. Um, it's probably a lot better but I suspect it's still facing similar problems because of the sheer height. Um, okay, um, now one of the very important points um, about the design of space is not just that it should complement a brand identity, but that the space itself can, can do an enormous amount to carry or firm a, um, uh, a brand identity. Very strikingly, Starbucks does not advertise. Those of you who are taking the introduction to business class, um, there is one of the presentations for uh, um, that talks about this, similarly in this as well too. If you have a look at the uh, TED, one of the TED talks there, um, it's explicitly stated by the uh, presenter, Starbucks doesn't advertise, they don't need to advertise because they create nice spaces which actually add value. So effectively, if you think in terms of shifting from a commoditized, standardized product to an evocative experience and a preparedness to pay much more for an experience rather than just a, a, a commodity product, Starbucks is an excellent example of this. This means that when Starbucks has gone into new markets, their investments in building their brand were first of all manifested in terms of rent, that they would pay high rents for good locations. They were going to have a lot of passing traffic 
uh, to try and communicate to their potential target markets. So we see, for example, in Ginza, that was one of their first locations. They paid an, ast an astonishing um, amount in terms of monthly rent when no one knew them. Normally you would think you have to spend a lot of money to, prom to promote your brand in order to be able to get the traffic to afford the rents in Ginza. Their idea was the, their promotion budget paid for the rent and the space was sufficiently alluring that it drew people in. They had a positive experience. Uh, word of mouth then spread elsewhere. And so we do see this everywhere. It's no accident that Starbucks position themselves in prominent locations just as you come out of the subway, for example, if you go to Ginza and you come out of the uh, Marunuchi Sen and you come up there at the Tsukiyabashi, as you're about to come up, you immediately see a Starbucks as you come through the Kaisatsuguchi. Uh, so you, you, you simply can't um, miss it. Now, historically, of course, um, uh, rulers understood this. This was a, a grand uh, ball, uh, dining room in Versailles. So if you, uh, no, what am I saying, not Versailles, so, uh, um, in the Louvre, what am I saying, forgive me, um, didn't sleep very much in the Louvre. So of course this was as um, the head of the US military, the, uh, the top general um, who led the Iraqi war, described their military strategy with the first um, Iraq war as shock and awe. This was a key design principle for reception halls, for great powers um, all over the world, regardless of culture, that when dignitaries, representatives, diplomats um, from other societies were hosted, they were presented with splendor, okay? Um, a sense of the uh, awe with which the French Empire uh, could strike in people throughout Europe. So what we need to see is we, as a process, we need to have design for ambience. We have to cultivate a distinct ambience so the retail space can sell itself, okay? and it has to have um, a particular segment in mind or actually create that segment if bringing a fresh perspective. And uh, we can see some very interesting cases of this where whole new subcultural identities were created by people such as Vivian West, um, Westwood, for example, uh, with Malcolm McLaren, Malcolm McLaren, her partner at the time, was, um, he was also the, uh, the promoter of the Sex Pistols. Um, the two of them really created the, um, the punk space through a store that they ran. Vivian Westwood started making clothes to sell in the store. It was a select store. Um, and in that process uh, defined punk culture. They were uh, the ones, for example, who, who played a key role in turning Doc Martens from policemen and um, factory workers footwear, safety footwear, into um, an iconic youth brand. Uh, if we think of uh, stores such as, or brands such as Diptyque, the famous um, French brand that you primarily associate these days with fragrance, uh, with perfumes and with um, fragrance candles, uh, they were one of the first uh, stores in Europe to really have this kind of global curatorial sensibility um, in, the, in the 60s and 70s uh, that was directed towards really embracing um, particularly um, Eastern flavors, designs, uh, sensibilities. It was, it was been partly associated with people dropping out in places like Morocco and India. Of course, uh, we can see 60 or 100 years earlier um, other instances of this, the grand emporiums of the late 19th century in London, for example, and if um, one of my very favorite retail spaces, if you get a chance, um, if you're in London, when you can go to London, when we can travel, go to the Liberty Department Store, very much associated with the Liberty Prince. Uh, that, of course, was a, uh, an emporium associated with an importing business, and uh, it was literally the, a grand exotic uh, place that you would go to see all these these wonderful curated things. 
uh, uh, curated, curated goods, luxuries from all over the world. Um, then they lent their strength to uh, domestic designers, particularly associated with the arts and crafts movement and the building itself is manifested in terms of fake Tudor and all the rest of it. Um, and very famously, the, uh, the Liberty Prints. Now to go back to diptych, very often when you're engaged in this curatorial function of bringing diverse things together and creating this unique retail experience, it leads to new ideas. And diptych takes credit for actually inventing the incense candle, that incense, and it's not the Japanese tradition, the incense candle, of course, um, has been through about burning incense. And of course, Europe has a long tradition, like most countries, uh, Japan as well, of making wax candles. But to actually perfume the wax was a very significant innovation, particularly because it uh, uh, effectively is a gentler way to disperse molecules than actually burning the, uh, the stuff that uh, is the bearer of the, of the scent. So what comes down to ultimately curatorial judgment is critical. You need taste, a sensibility. You have to bring coherence to disparate objects, diverse material, functional aesthetic properties. And a unique vision means new combinations often of old elements. And actually that is one of the working definitions of creativity, that nothing is created anew from nothing, okay? So the select retail genre is very attractive um, for several reasons. It broadens the value proposition offered to consumers. You can keep adding a huge array of things. You, you can get hipster beer wax, you can get your beard trimmed while, you, while you're having a coffee, while your partner is shopping um, for whether it's books or music or whatever, all in the one uh, retail space, okay? Uh, it also gives more resources for the retail designer to create ambience in the first place. And particularly the shift towards the found object thing allows the brand to be assigned, um, aligned with so many other brands and the positive country of origin effects we see there. So you see in um, so many of the select stores in Japan, whether it's Tomorrowland, but particular if you see Yena, the, of Iena and Ediface, um, associated with Bay Cruise. Uh, they celebrate anything French. And indeed the Iena store, the, uh, the women's select store in Higashi Shinjuku has a abstracted Tokyo, uh, sorry, Paris um, map as its main design feature on the wall and actually on the facade of the store. Also, as we've moved towards becoming more knowledge intensive workers, uh, when we no longer actually get dirty for a living, when we no longer actually use tools um, in industrial spaces, some people do, but the vast majority of people um, don't, that actually the artisan or the industrial and whatnot has become chic. Um, when we all work with, you know, IMAX, for example, we can use found objects that used to be in factories uh, as internal decor. I actually have a big storage box um, here in my office, uh, which I bought at some select store uh, here in Tokyo on a sale. And the storage boxes were once used on a factory line in France to prepare components for the line workers to be able to pick out components and put them in order when they're assembling whatever product it, ha it happens to have been. So we, we can see this, this is, this is actually a, uh, a select store in Marais, the Marais in Paris, uh, a lovely area. Uh, and so they've got a lot of new product. They have a very nice in-house restaurant and coffee shop, nice bookstore as well. And they sell some interesting items of furniture that have been carefully curated at a very large premium. So it's not just that this uh, curatorial function is in some sense cultural appropriation, well, I think that's an incredibly awful cliche in most contexts that is happening across borders. This is happening across times. So across generational cultural divides, for example. Now there are plenty of Swedes and Japanese who've gotten quite rich buying up um, furniture from old folks or when old folks have passed away and their, their relatives have cleared their houses in Scandinavia. If you can see the, uh, the unit behind me is a uh, mid-century. Um, it's a Danish uh, 
cupboard that was in, imported by a, uh, a Japanese um, retailer. And when I had a uh, Danish student come into my office once, he looked at me and said, hmm, this kind of looks like my grandmother's house. <laughs> okay, so we, uh, in different contexts, things take on uh, a premium value that they may have had, may not have had in the original, original um, context. We were having been back in Australia in January and helping my parents um, pack up and downsize their um, possessions of a lifetime so they can move to somewhere smaller for because of health reasons, uh, health challenges. Um, I came home with uh, to came home to Tokyo uh, with quite a curated selection of artifacts, uh, mid-century artifacts from mum and dad's house and some that even come from my grandparents' houses when they packed them up. Um, th some things were just meaningful to me because I um, associated them with you know, youthful experiences. And I think as you get older, nostalgia becomes a more powerful thing. So I have a plate in that unit behind me, which is not to my taste, other than it is uh, one of a dinner set that my grandmother used to serve up um, wonderful roast beef sandwiches to me on when I was seven or eight or nine at her house in the country. So very much attach um, meaning to it. I also brought back once a uh, dinner set that my mum was going to throw out because I had seen in S Nation they were selling each piece um, of this mid-century English dinner set quite bashed up for about 1,500 to 1,800 yen. Mum had this old worn out thing that she'd had from when she was, she always says, oh, I got this when we were first married. Oh, I think it's time for it to go and to go out. I said, no, mum, you know, you, I, if need be, I can actually flog this off to a bunch of mid-century loving hipsters um, in Japan. Um, instead, of course, I use it in my uh, holiday home. So some things which are just everyday kind of commodities can be repurposed uh, to create a certain ambience. Uh, these are little Campari soda bottles. Those of you who've spent time in Italy or, or know this from other places, such as in France, this is, a, this is the, the Campari drink um, sold in a very short, very short bottle, super cheap, okay? And a very clever little um, uh, lamp created which of course speaks to um, its origins in Italy. Um, similarly, the mere passage of time and third party accreditation and whatnot, but also the embodied uh, graphic design and the trends in graphic design over time. This is a uh, restaurant in Paris and just uh, as the stickers accumulate, uh, you see a certain attractiveness there. Um, if you are in Yurakcho, and well, particularly going from Ginza to Yurakcho and walk under the concourse under the railway tracks there heading just towards the Peninsula Hotel, there is this wonderful wall which is covered by cinema posters that date back to the 60s and the 70s. And they're, they're frayed, they're falling off, but it is absolutely beautiful um, in its uh, patina. I actually snapped some pictures there uh, on the weekend and I, I will share a couple. Uh, subsequently. So surfaces and ambience matter. Uh, you may have seen the very lively business in Japan, in, in Tokyo in particular, in knocking down old houses. By the way, the uh, that work is overwhelmingly done by Kurds um, of Turkish nationality um, who have generally applied for refugee status in Japan, have been denied, but Japan chooses not to expel them, so to deport them. So they live in this kind of gray zone um, and they play a key role in disassembling old houses. And you'll see that they're very meticulous in the way they unpack it. Um, some lesser buildings, just they have these big, jaws of death that just munch houses and grind them up. Uh, but wooden houses, they tend to more systematically disassemble, partly because there is some resale value for some of the wood uh, that have a distinctive patina. One of the sad things we see actually out in the countryside is beautiful old farmhouses, sometimes hundreds of years old, because it's very expensive to replace the thatched roofs, a lot of people don't. So they're actually disassembled and the, uh, the highly patented um, beams, for example, are just simply sold for in, um, interior decoration in Tokyo. So you go to um, Izakaya, 
in the the basement of a new office building and you go in and it has this kind of ambience as if you're back in uh, in uh, early Meiji period or late Edo or something just because it's kind of stuck onto the concrete um, the uh, the painful truth is that a lot of that perceived materiality is achieved through actually knocking down the original buildings so we can think of a space as host okay in general um, there is a increasing shift in terms of the performance and the exhibition of art towards simply creating spaces which can host famous paintings and touring and fam famous artwork and a lot of its installation artwork. So the spaces have had to become a lot bigger to be hosts uh, for more contemporary art. That if you go to the National Arts Center, Shinkokuritsu Bijitsukan in Roppongi, it's striking, a very grand, grand building, quite beautiful building, designed by uh, Kurokawa Kishio, uh, who passed away a few years ago, who also, by the way, designed uh, Takaranababa Big Box. Um, this is uh, uh, some people love to hate, but, but it was a striking architectural intervention. Um, I think it's quite appropriate that it is a really big box, given all the Wasad, generations of Wasada students who've been drunk outside it and throwing up everywhere to make it look like a bunker, I think is actually quite appropriate to protect it from the, the drunken sword, I say. Um, but we do see that more and more art spaces are just simply designed as a host for the Turing exhibition. Now, this, of course, is the, the Louvre and they own the Mona Lisa. Um, but when people think, so many tourists think of the, uh, the Louvre, unfortunately, they don't think so much of the building. Um, they think of it as, or, or as an institution, as an art collection. They think of it as certain distinctive um, tourist uh, destinations and bizarre selfie opportunities. Why people need to see themselves in a picture with great art, I personally never understand. Um, but I do very much enjoy taking pictures of people taking pictures of themselves in places that I can't otherwise comprehend. So we see more and more the design of spaces as temporary host. This presents a dilemma in terms of the aesthetic neutrality of the space. That's why the large proportion, the very largest proportion these days of museum extensions and new museum spaces are big white boxes because they're effectively neutral and it allows a wide array of purposes of art exhibitions for example this has helped to make the Japanese architectural firm Sana, who designed that Rolex Learning Center we saw um, in the previous class uh, to be very much go-to Japanese artists they're about to do the new Sydney Modern for example they did the new museum in New York they are particularly good at creating evocative white boxes with lots of black glass and um, moderate admission of natural light, not too much because it kills the artwork. So when we think of hosting spaces, there are multi-purpose spaces as we, as we see here. Um, so much modernism, of the features of modernism, um, mid-century architecture was influenced by traditional Japanese architecture, tatami grid systems, sliding and removable doors, all of, all of these functional capacity to cut up and re Re, uh, to use one space in different ways that was a feature of traditional Japanese architecture carried over not only into the design of domestic architecture of homes in the West, but even more so in commercial architecture. The design of the modern convention center owes a great deal to Western modernist architects learning lessons from Japanese traditional architecture and then going to building supplies companies and ask them to develop materials. So for example, some Richard Neutra, um, very influential Viennese modernist architect who moved to Southern California and played a huge role in defining mm, Californian modernism. He was the first person, first person for example, in a domestic um, home to actually have a glass sliding door and it had to be custom made, custom made. Now it is just ubiquitous these days, you know, the sliding, the sliding door. Okay. It's between every, every veranda and um, living room and every, in the tiniest apartment we have these days. So, and he was very much influenced um, by Japanese architecture, the ability to divide up spaces for larger spaces and smaller spaces. Um, those societies that have actually invested in these spaces have um, 
found themselves well equipped for the emergency of COVID-19, where one of the first things that governments did was to appropriate convention centers as emergency hospitals, as quarantine spaces, for example, um, and unfortunately in some places as, as morgues as well. One of the interesting twists is repurposed space. Um, with heritage conservation, not being able to walk, uh, knock down places of uh, historical significance, the more and more the built environment is understood to be part of our, our built heritage. And so there's a real imperative to be able to reuse these spaces. Sometimes we, we, we see found spaces as well. The event planner finds a space that's not yet repurposed. And in um, fashion shows, they're often looking for unusual spaces. Um, old aircraft hangars, um, so many different things. So there was one documentary, unfortunately, I, I had on the website, but it's been taken down because of a takedown notice. One um, fashion brand in, J in Japan, they had a great idea that they wanted to launch their exhibition in a cave. Now, it took a long time to convince a designer that um, the geography of Japan being volcanic, they didn't have many caves. Caves were kind of difficult to, uh, to find. And in the end, they did a very large tent in Chiba instead. Okay, so there's also this, this dynamic of evoke spaces that I mentioned. You can use light, you can use boundering techniques. Um, uh, projection mapping is a way to define spaces. Uh, the repurposes space, for example, a former garage. Um, I had my first car fixed in this space, kind of where those businessmen are sitting there drink, um, drinking their coffee and talking about whatever they're talking about. My clapped out 1973 Ford Escort with a leaky radiator was repaired by some guys so I could get home from university. It's now become an extraordinarily good coffee shop. Um, on a very large scale, we see repurposed space. The Tate Modern, for example, former power station in London and they very deliberately have played with the art, the industrial um, ethos by by leaving key uh, parts of material evidence of, of that former life. One of the most famous in terms of re reusing a space is um, the Biennale exhibition space in Venice. Every um, second year, it's architecture in the in, um, in the off years, or the the visual artists would say in the on years. Um, it is uh, the Art Biennale. And it's in Arsenale. This was a huge factory of the Venetian Republic where ships were built. And it's a, it's a massive space. And then, of course, you get um, uh, a whole range of exhibitors in this kind of national exhibits, in this case, um, Chinese um, exhibition that create temporary spaces inside the large, large exhibition space. And um, some play more with the existing materiality than uh, others do. In the Chinese case, to roll back, it's, it's a space within a space. Um, in this particular case, uh, they wanted to celebrate more than, more than anything else the, uh, the four to 500 year old um, pattern of the, uh, the found environment. And so just put up glass panels and then used uh, digital projection to communicate their message. Now, this is a space I'm fond of. Um, this is actually just a car park between um, Yotsia, where I live, and the Waseda campus. But it's, I find there's something really beautiful about this, but other people would probably scratch their head. But uh, I, I like these kind of found spaces. I'm not sure that I uh, would advocate you get married in it, although I sort of would respect someone who held a wedding ceremony here. But I, but I certainly can see um, some interesting event being done there. Um, Budapest ruin, ruin bars, uh, if and when you get to get, go to Budapest, you'll see this is something that arose in um, post-communist Budapest. There were large numbers of empty houses, buildings indeed, that had not been occupied, largely in the old Jewish quarter, with one of the tragedies of uh, the Holocaust was that um, many Jewish property owners during World War II uh, lost their lives, or um, if they were very lucky, just simply escaped, but unfortunately very few did. Um, and under this, this strange idiosyncratic communist regime, which kind of recognized, or partially recognized old property rights, didn't abrogate them. Um, and then after the collapse of communism, people who'd been living temporarily in spaces as tenants often moved out. There was a, there was a lot of people going abroad. So there were a lot of spaces to be used uh, for virtually free. 
and the economy was in a bad way. So lots of entrepreneurs effectively did were the equivalent of going to the Solday Gourmet, the big rubbish um, days here in Tokyo, found a whole bunch of mismatching furniture and created ruin bars, these bars. The, the, um, there's dozens of them at one point, there were literally hundreds of them in Budapest, and it's become a very significant draw, par, draw card to Budapest itself. Unfortunately, with a combination of cheap flights with Ryanair and whatnot, um, you get a bunch of drunken English yobs um, invading um, Budapest. Um, now, often stuffy old institutions and quite literally stuff, stuffed um, animals in stuffy old museums have presented a huge dilemma for things like museums of natural history. Uh, wasn't much fun in a digital era to take the kids to show, you know, to walk around and look hundred year old stuffed animals in glass cages. The Museum of Natural History in Paris has done an absolutely brilliant thing with applying design thinking. They really refreshed the public space. They got rid of all the glass cases. They took the animals out of the cases. And um, in, a, in truly biblical fashion, it looks like um, they're all heading towards Noah's Ark. They lined up all the animals in a wonderful procession um, right through the middle of the uh, museum, uh, got huge buzz out of this and contributed enormously to attendance rates, to, of course, it's a public institution and, and the French state is distinctive in how much it funds these institutions, but it did contribute in, very much to the budget as well. Uh, to simply create a more evocative space that, that whole families um, wanted to visit. Um, back to the temporary, it's not just the large trade show, uh, particularly in a place like Japan where you have lots of structures being knocked down, where very weak heritage listing, um, even, even truly historically significant buildings are very rarely preserved in Japan, even though architects often um, protest their demolition. There's lots of opportunities for temporary retail spaces. Um, this is near Toronomon Hills, um, we can see here. Um, literally, this space is assembled on site. Even smaller ones can be brought, brought in on the back of a truck and actually uh, dropped off, okay? Um, and again, this is a select store brand, Urban Research, using this temporary space. And of course, they've got the temporary di dining experience as well there. Okay, um, so the facades themselves can make significant brand statements. Uh, this is that uh, select store that I mentioned back in uh, uh, the Marais, um, where books become a significant uh, communicative statement. Sometimes uh, the books cannot be touched as quite bizarrely I've experienced in Japan repeatedly. You go into coffee shops and whatnot and they've got books everywhere and you go to take one off the shelf and you're told, ah, ma kazari mono dake desu. So books have, reduced, have been reduced to pure ornamentation. If you go to the Sonia Rikyo um, flagship store in Minami Aoyama, you'll see this, that actually wonderful wall of books and of course the books are not for sale, the books cannot be touched. Um, we do see some interesting cases in Japan where the facade is used as a effectively a map to the store or a list of the brands that are contained there within. So it's literally a guide to the retail space, lit up smack bang in front of the store. Uh, there is a bit of an old tradition of this. This one, um, it's a bit uh, dodgy. It's uh, the uh, Shiroi Bara. This is a hostess bar of a very retro Showa thing that goes right back to Showa Yonjunin day, maybe even earlier. In um, back blocks in Ginza, you can see this. Um, and so this was for the, uh, the salary man who might be missing home. You can see that um, uh, you can, they, they, they had the, uh, the names of the, the, uh, the hostesses um, hung up outside on the facade uh, to show where um, if prefectures were represented by hostesses that night. So you could go in there and you could ask for the, uh, from your Furosato, Musume from your Furosato, you can have her called um, to attend to your lonely Oya genus. Okay. I, I, I love it for its show of retroness. Okay. Yeah. Oh, hey, show a Rokunen. Wow. Okay. So that actually uh, takes us to back before World War II. Um, now, some places simply want to communicate. Um, we are pitching to 
nutty kin new rich people come on in this is your space um this is in dalian in china too actually okay um so many other places of course the facade just simply speaks to the best product uh here is a wonderful um ice cream store in rome very famous for its pistachio so they literally call the place um kind of green pistachio and so the whole decor and everything is around that so window the art the art of window displays in retail space is a significance a transition from the facade to the interior retail space um, it also allows for regular refreshment seasonality becomes a major attraction in a lot of cities going down to see the christmas window displays is uh becomes quite a traditional thing it allows lots of changing fashions collaborative ventures po profiling particular brands um it is a key traditionally been a key instrument of the department stores um business model but it can also be um, very boutique um stores this is again in paris this is um selling um luxuries from the southwest of france actually i didn't have any lunch this is making me think hungry just thinking about it other boutique stores this is again in the marais in paris um they sell uh antique photographs which is a huge segment in japan is remarkably underdeveloped as a business in other places um uh tabio abroad this is a japanese socks brand uh have been very much getting into locations again following the starbucks ethos of don't pay money for advertising pay money on rent and have your store be evocative this is tabio um store in the marais in paris okay um one thing is uh, if you do get to travel to paris as soon as you step off the shuttle bus from charles de gaulle airport you will land right in front of uniqlo it's a very strange thing when you fly from narita or haneda get to paris take the bus down to um opera in central paris you step off and there in front of you is uniqlo um but uniqlo in paris really wants to communicate that this notion of that it's a little bit like ginza so it's got what they think looks is the kind of the ginza ticker tape kind of thing um foregrounding japanness uh Chirarism, chiratto miedo, less is more. This is uh, just a glimpse is much more attractive than marumie. Okay, drawing parallels. I'm not going to go into too much detail on. Uh, this is a sushi uh, store in a uh, sushi place, sushi restaurant in Oazo in um, Tokyo, in front of Tokyo Station. They've done very nice thing with frosting the glass, actually, with like sumi and there's only a sliver of the glass that is left clear for pass for for customers passing out or people passing by outside it protects the privacy of the customers inside but it allows you to see the sushi um so very clever just hint of what's good profiling the very best in a very selective way i'm going to stand in general department stores again this is paris pronto um collaborating with advertisers at certain junctures again window dressing in spectacular fashion um if you are going to make a feature of window dressing you really want to maintain it i had to take a picture of this though because this is a uh, bridal boutique in copenhagen that um on multiple visits to copenhagen i noticed they had not fixed the huge crack in the glass window um and each time i walked by with various friends we always made a joke about it that you know that's not kind of the message you want to send to people who are pondering getting married bridal wear that looks like someone has actually like thrown a rock or smashed a glass or it looks like smash smashing smashing your illusions about future marital blicks so fix the window guys on the other hand just across the street from it is my very favorite store in the world ilums um they have a small store in Tokyo which is actually run by Sebo under license but their window dressing is astonishing um always very seasonal captures a very distinctive scandi flair as does their product selection inside so the exterior and interior context very much coheres with danish design values with sensibility so this is the store here it also lets um very soft ambient light in from the top so it's it's just a really beautiful retail experience where wood and um oiled rather than varnished wood is a distinctive part of the danish sensibility and we've seen earlier that um, 
Copenhagen's airport actually has this as well too. And so we can see some other examples here. These are all just um, window displays. So we see at the, uh, the airport um, in Copenhagen, so a modern element, but again, letting in lots of light. So a very strong sense of place. Um, on the other hand, the mall can be the very opposite, can be a place of complete escapism. This is Abu Dhabi in the middle of the desert. Now they do um, have on the Gulf, they do have a sea, but there are no waves. You cannot use a surfboard there. And of course, um, in the Middle East, you shouldn't really be walking around dressing in bikinis and all the rest of it as well too. Um, but if you step back and say, okay, no, that looks more Abu Dhabi. That's the mall where, where it was in, okay? Um, a building itself may try to project values of, say, transparency. We saw this in Berlin. I mentioned it with the use of glass. Um, in this particular case, Aix-en-Provence railway station for the uh, high-speed high train, the, uh, the TGV. Um, this, uh, they built this one in glass. I, I, I'm guessing, but if certainly based on the experience of when one arrives, is the very iconic mountain, Mont Saint Victoire, that figured in so many of Cezanne's paintings, you can see when you actually get off the train there. Um, and it's a major reason, of course, it's Cezanne's hometown and whatnot. And you go to his studio, it looked like you went out to buy a pack of ciggies, cigarettes, and just got lost and never came back again. It's kind of preserved, at least the way that that's how they want to present it. So a lot of people go there because it is such a story destination. Um, there's so much associated with Cezanne and the landscapes are so famous, not just him, but other uh, um, artists as well. So the building ideally allows people to see that. Unfortunately, because this is, is the French National Railways, like the TGV trains themselves, um, they, they could offer a wonderful view of the landscape if only they could wash the windows. Um, but uh, neither the trains nor you can see here the glass gets much of a wash. People, probably the unions have had a fight about that. Um, whereas in Japan, of course, everything is, all the trains are meticulously polished and it's a great way to see the country. So this, a lot of questions about how you actually communicate place through a design space. Um, if you arrive at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, um, it is quite a grand structure that architects have compared to the, uh, the rebuilding of the Jewish Third Temple. Um, with grand pillars, and uh, this is just in the arrivals you go down with grand grand ramps and all the rest of it. Um, there, there is this kind of global third space architecture. This is Zurich Airport, um, and how do you overcome this problem of airports having to be very big, and especially in COVID nineteen, um, if we return ever return to travel with social distancing, uh, to accommodate a lot of people moving through without them being overwhelming spaces. So very often it's actually structures within structures. And we see that European airports are increasingly doing this extraordinarily well. Um, historically in Japan, public spaces tended to be designed by engineers. So as long as they didn't fall down, they were approved and the architects really didn't get a look in. Um, belatedly, there has been a recognition that therefore public spaces in Japan have not been very evocative. Um, Haneda's International Terminal has tried to do something about that with ambient design and place branding. And so you can see various interventions, uh, whether it's the design of the carpet, whether it is a uh, kind of a digital kakijiku, for example. Um, so very kind of Japanese thematic visual elements to get some sense of place because this is what travelers want. Um, you're jet lagged and whatnot and literally it's like where am I can be an extraordinarily disorienting thing. Finally, you can see very distinctive signatures emerging with very different materialities. This is Japan's most famous um, architect, Kenzo Tange. Um, but this is St. Mary's Cathedral up behind Waseda. So when you can come back to Waseda, um, make sure you cross the Kandagawa head up the hill and go to this astonishingly beautiful building and the space that's inside. And it's a Catholic cathedral uh, designed by a Japanese architect, who, by the way, whose first um, win in a um, architectural project was actually to um, win a design for a new master plan of Tokyo uh, with a grand Shinto shrine by Mount Fuji and a boulevard that connected it to Aoyama to celebrate an, uh, no, Dai Nippon Teikoku. So this was during World War II. So he kind of 
buried his Shinto nationalist, um, imperialist, early architectural credentials and embraced peace. He very famously did the um, Peace Museum, uh, Peace Memorial at Hiroshima, um, and then got the commission from the Catholic Church and also architect, uh, key architectural contributions to the 64 Olympics. So um, stop that there. I'll flip over now to a little bit briefly on interface design. Oh, hang on. Yep, there we go. Let me take a swig. Sorry, it's all talking slides this week with a tiny little head mind bobbing around. Don Norman is um, the leading writer, advocate of better interface design. And um, there are two TED Talks on the website. Um, the first of the two on the website, it, was, it wasn't Don's best, finest hour. Um, it was this kind of, he subsequently had written a couple of very influ influential shorter articles about this um, des uh, designing of social media platforms designed to constantly grab our attention in ways that are, that are not good for us. And I reference that actually in that chapter I made available right in the beginning of the semester on creativity under attention scarcity. So that, that first TED talk, that we, he was still kind of getting his thoughts, uh, or his thoughts were still evolving and ended up in a better place. The second TED talk, I, I almost took down the first one, but I thought some of you may have already seen it. So um, the second one there is the rather more interesting one. Uh, where he really talks about his um, his initial evolution in thinking uh, about design. He started off with cognitive science, um, but he particularly talks about in, in, in that presentation about how people react to spaces, interfaces, objects, social dynamics, and talks about different ways in which people react and function. Um, and so it's very, very well worth looking at that second presentation. Um, first of all, just in terms of interface design, uh, helping people navigate spaces, um, often complex spaces, is a challenge. I'm not sure they always get it right. This is IDC Otsuka, the furniture store, which almost went bankrupt recently and was taken over by um, Yamada Denki. I'm, I keep shaking my head at this. I mean, was, was the designer being underpaid and therefore decided to get revenge on IDC Otsuka. I don't know. The one at the left shows the male bathrooms. The one at the right, right shows the female bathrooms. And you can just read this in ways that I just don't think are appropriate for signs outside a bathroom. But uh, a lot of people have kind of remarked on this particular one. Very famous one from my hometown, Brisbane, um, where there was a, uh, a bank and they were merged into several. And then in 1998, they commissioned a new logo, um, which is the one in the middle, which combined their previous logos. You can see the Suncorp logo was there, um, and Metway Bank were there. And in an earlier version of Suncorp, they'd had this sunny sun because Queensland's logo is the Sunshine State, because that's how they sell themselves compared to other states, particularly Victoria. Um, and so there was this long-standing thing about the sun and the sunshine. Um, so in 1998, they commissioned a graphic designer to do this logo in the middle, and it got through a whole bunch of executive approvals, and it lasted until 2016. However, um, and I'm conscious I'm being filmed here, <laughs> and this is gonna go public, lots of kids were very quick to say, that looks like a floppy willy um, in the middle there. And once you see it like that, it's very difficult to unsee it like that. So it was kind of routinely mocked for the longest time, but the bank flatly refused to say that it could be visually read in a different way. But I'm sure they were quite relieved with another merger then they were able to um, rebrand themselves and go straight back to a, a simple Sun logo. Now, Japan, when you have mergers, you get spectacular instances of Chuta Humper and a number of the banks have done this. Um, Chuta humper is this wonderful Japanese word for half-assed, um, not this, not that. 
SMBC, Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation. Those of you who read Japanese, notice the Japanese title is Mitsui Sumitomo Ginko. Now, I can never remember whether it's Sumitomo Mitsui or Mitsui Sumitomo. It's both, depending on whether it is in English or Japanese. Mitsui and Sumitomo were both very famous um, keiretsu, formerly zaibatsu, very strong pride. These two large banks, they both believed it was a meeting of equals and they couldn't agree on whose name went first in the merged entity. So they decided to compromise and have it English in one way and Japanese in the other way. Now that for me is just the kind of half acidness um, I have an almost pathological kind of hate, hatred for, but we see in many, many cases, um, constant mergers in, in university departments in uh, Western countries, you mean school names end up being incredibly long. You know, the School of Humanities, Social Sciences, um, and Cultural Studies. And, you know, if I was the president of the university, I, I'd have said, call yourself the School of Stuff or something. I don't know. Um, so I, I believe that no organization, department, or organizational unit should have a name longer than four words max, ideally three or better one. Of course, communists everywhere just simply numbered them to overcome these kinds of problems, which I think is going too far. Okay, interface. Um, look around, lots of designs that are not really for the user, but more for the people are putting it there. Um, the toilet paper dispenser. Um, the paper never comes out, does it? Uh, because of the weight of the other one stacked on it. But the reason why it's designed like this is simply um, because that's how accounting wanted it designed, because they didn't want toilet paper stolen. Okay, um, so we end up with this bizarre thing where you actually have to push the roll up to get some, get some out. Okay, this um, Norman's book, The Design of Everyday Things, hugely influential. He, he emphasizes visibility. A product should naturally communicate how to use it. It should have a very clear conceptual model and it should give feedback. Um, this is why when you have your touchpad, for example, um, it clicks, makes sounds. That's haptic feedback. You can actually turn it off. Um, and it's very interesting when you get no feedback whatsoever from a device, it takes quite a bit of you getting used to. I'm one of these people who get all my electronic devices and I immediately mute all the sounds and whatnot. Um, but there are some people who like their phone to beep at them every single letter they touch. And don't you love being next to one of those people in the coffee shop or something? Okay. Mute your keyboard. Um, or you, you touch, um, your, your interface. So to quote Donald Norman, when simple things need pictures, labels, or instructions, design has failed. Okay. So visibility is a key thing. Affordances, he key term here, perceived and actual properties of an object. Um, as he says here, um, knobs are for turning, slots are for inserting things into, that the form of the thing gives us a big hint as to its usages. Um, and you should be focused on constraints then limit, limit the number of possible readings or applications of messages, instructions, controls, or patterns of assembly and use. Um, Ikea has got a lot better over time in designing things so that the, it can only go one way. Um, in the past, it was so easy to assemble an Ikea product and realize you have one panel upside down. Um, they're more and more designing them um, as they become a global company and uh, they've realized that uh, probably they've contributed globally to the divorce rate by causing couples to fight over assembling Ikea furniture, that a key design principle is to make sure that you can't get it wrong, okay? Uh, one thing Apple is very good at is in stopping you um, doing stupid things to yourself with interfaces. Um, also mappings, the relationship between controls and results in the world. Steering a wheel obviously changes a car's direction. And so there are big debates then about how interfaces should map into changes um, in the real world. And whether you want to scroll up or scroll down is a bit of a personal preference. For example, if you borrow someone's computer and they're the other way, it can drive you mad and you can have endless debates about that. So to quote here, a good conceptual model allows us to predict the effects of our actions. Without a good model, we operate by rote, blindly. We do operations as we, we are told to do them. We can't fully appreciate why, what are, um, effects to expect, or what to do if things go wrong. 
as long as things work properly, when we can manage, when things go wrong, however, or when we come upon a novel situation, then we need a deeper understanding, a good model. So a good product interface reinforces mental modes of how the product works. It doesn't mislead for a false simplicity. And you can find plenty of examples of where Wasada has never taken that on board, <laughs> okay? Um, anything, it's, it's web interfaces and whatnot. Moodle's got some kind of counterintuitive things too that people are always complaining about. Um, you know, you kind of eventually learn how to do things in a counterintuitive way um, and get used to it. Very importantly, we, to navigate the world, we're always using mental shortcuts. A lot of information is sourced from the environment and it's, it's a prompt to our short, shortcuts. Well-organized interfaces and workplaces have self-reminding properties, okay? Um, and there are a whole range of ways that we can trick our minds um, when things are not so clear cut. Simple stories um, or a mnemonic may help. Uh, I remember when I first came to Japan, there was a New Zealander working there. He, he didn't speak Japanese at all, um, but he knew that you had to be very polite when you started a meal and he was trying to remember itadakimasu. And then he told himself, eat a duck if you must, eat a duck if you must. And he said, if I just mumble eat a duck if I must, um, then I can be polite in, in most contexts. I thought it was kind of bizarre. I then met an absolutely mad Scotsman who, regardless of what was spoken to him in Japanese, he just went, oh, watashi mo, watashi mo, me too, um, which said that he got him through, got him quite well through two thirds of all situations in Japan and made him look like a freak in the other third. And he thought that was a pretty good ratio. Okay, so making mistakes is normal. To err is to be human, okay? The old expression is. So interface design must accommodate and minimize the consequences of operator error. Okay, the device must not punish you um, for making a mistake. Making mistakes is literally what human beings do. It is the very nature of it. And moreover, most error comes about because design is inherently um, poor. So good interface design is intuitive, it's simply and accurately labeled. Uh, controls are very clear cut. There's a consistency in the concept and the mappings throughout all aspects of the interface. And it gives you informative error messages. How many error messages? You get a 404. Um, how many times have you had to Google the error message to get some sense of what might be going wrong? And Don Norman and many other designers emphasize that you must have modesty towards the, the users. But how many times have you gone to an organization, maybe the sales office, um, and being kind of treated like an idiot because you didn't understand some form or you missed something on a website or whatever. Most of the time, it's not your fault. The actual graphic design or the layout of the interface has been really, really bad. Um, it's, got, it's the classic fallacy of assumed knowledge. People know their intent when they lay out a document, for example, and they assume that other people will read it in the same way. And of course, we must not let art triumph over us usability. We can all make things simple and beautiful just by um, uh, removing all interfaces. A lineup of labeled buttons um, with their function on them uh, is the most user-friendly of all devices. So it's simply a question of how can we make that beautiful as well? So uh, if you find yourself routinely screwing up filling out documents and whatnot and feeling vaguely annoyed when you're treated like an idiot in an organization. Um, rest assured that I have that tendency um, to an almost extreme degree. I absolutely struggle to navigate uh, documents that are poorly laid out. That's one reason why I'm really, really passionate um, about this perspective of uh, Normans. I'm looking at time we're a bit behind um, in terms of uh, attention, uh, gaining attention through you know, designing attention. Um, I have given you the slides. Um, I'll have a couple of questions on the slides and the, and the video material, so work through it, but I will still talk to those slides um, next week. 
but I will put a few questions there because I don't want people to fall too much behind in engaging with particularly the relevant video material. So let's do it that way. The questions related to uh, the attention topic will primarily relate to the online material, okay? Video material on the website. Um, now, let me see a uh, couple of uh, things to post it because I can't actually see the chat when I'm doing this screen sharing. Okay, um, Shibilov still has that fantastic. Okay, uh, very nice question about um, from Ayano. If nostalgia serves as brand image, right, or help sell things, does more simple products sell because it can fit more images? Um, re ah, very good question, actually. Um, I think it's twofold things that uh, simpler products can have more meanings invested in them but then in a sense that there's less for um, the story to stick to. There's less in terms of immediate recognition. I'm, um, I'm not gonna pull that out because of time. Um, but if, if I was to pull out the plate from my grandma's house, it's a very distinctive um, pattern uh, that was very popular in the 1950s in England and was exported to Australia. Um, I could spot it you know, 50 meters away, probably. Okay, that kind of pattern and, and it would trigger so much. So a very distinctive form is storied, by the way, that vase up there next to the picture of my grandmother's. Um, that's actually a, it's a Japanese vase that I bought fairly recently, but is made by the same company that made the sugar bowl. It was one of, one of my grandmother's houses, which my sister got um, and I always wanted and she wouldn't give it to me. So I then came across that in a um, secondhand market and grabbed it because it's, it's the same glassware. So the particular form and the color um, had something very much strikingly in common. And it was also a nice thing to think that oh, my, my grandma bought that in about 1962 or something as an import from Japan. And here I find it all these years later in Japan. So, right. Um, okay. And Question about the select store. Okay, so the select store is literally any store that uh, it's 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 a category title in Japan um, that is curating a whole range of different brands, but very often have their own in-house brands. So the classic ones are Ships, Tomorrowland, um, Beams. Um, yeah, half half a dozen of them um, at least. Um, I, I have a sales routine where I, uh, I, I walk around Mudder and Ritchie in sales season and do my, do my lacks of the, uh, the select stores, for example. And then there's a whole bunch of boutique ones um, as, as well. Okay, right. Uh, so pretty much covering there. Finally, just to remind you, next Thursday noon, your three minute um, video is due. And what you have to do is you have to upload it on your own YouTube channel. And if you don't want it to be associated with your name, you can create a sub channel. I've talked about that. Um, if you need tips on um, how to approach any of aspects there, start of course with a bunch of links I've got on the website, but just Google, you know, it's, um, you know, there's an enormous number of YouTubers, vloggers doing, do, doing, short YouTube videos about how to do YouTube videos, right? It's, it's one of the largest kind of genres because literally millions of people are getting um, into this space. Um, so do that there. And the important thing is that you will post the link into a upload interface um, on the site there. And then I will gather all of them together and I will then create a playlist with everyone's video that will be unlisted. Um, but do keep in mind, of course, that people will be able to see the playlist. Um, and actually the way it works at playlist is even with an unlisted channel that if someone actually um, added you to another playlist, um, then it would be seeable. So if you want to use a uh, nom de plume, so a name other than your own, um, then that's absolutely fine. Just do that through the, what's called the sub channel. And you can have multiple sub channels off your own um, YouTube uh, Google account. Now I'll hang around for a bit um, afterwards. Uh, I will have to get off uh, in about half an hour max, but I'm happy to hang around and answer um, any questions. So just to reiterate, the quiz will go live on Thursday and it will cover everything we've covered up to now. It will also cover attention 
but the online video materials on that and I will save up the main material um, on attention the stuff that I'm going to talk about until I've covered that um, in the class next week so that will be in the next quiz so thank you very much and I do hope we get some sunny weather at least by next week the uh, the only advantage of this bad weather is the opportunity cost of staying in and doing all your all your projects and stuff and maybe a not as high although it's an utter pain in the neck shooting video outside which has been slowing me down enormously.